can you hear me and now uh, good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen my name is uh, Michal Jantowski and I'm the executive director of the Václav Havel library and uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to open this uh, 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 mini symposium as uh, we called it and uh, uh, the title of it tells the story and the story is getting the message across uh, and uh, we are going to revisit some of uh, the events of uh, 1989 not just November 17 but uh, 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 even before then, and the work of uh, people who uh, carried the stories, the messages uh, across, and they were mostly, though not exclusively, the uh, foreign correspondents uh, in uh, uh, then Czechoslovakia and, uh, and their colleagues in the editorial offices uh, abroad and uh, and for those uh, of you who were born after 1989 this is uh, maybe a little difficult to comprehend but uh, 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 it was just about the only channel to get the news uh, outside of Czechoslovakia which was uh, then uh, still in a regime of uh, full censorship uh, the Czech media uh, did not report about uh, uh, what was happening in the opposition, what was happening in the streets, and if they did, they did it in a very uh, skewed and, and biased manner that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, did not uh, tell the whole story at all. And uh, so, these people who we are going to uh, listen, uh, hear from uh, this afternoon do, did a enormous uh, work and they did it under very exacting and sometimes quite uh, adventurous uh, uh, circumstances because most of you will have remembered the story of the 17th of November, but the truth is that before the student demonstration on the 17th of November, there were a number of other protests and demonstrations and the uh, uh, foreign reporters were there for most of them or all of them and, and they did not have, uh, as they do today, uh, you know, labels of press and media and don't touch, etc., etc. They were just as uh, uh, much of the prey as the demonstrators were, and uh, uh, and some of them felt it uh, uh, on their own bodies. Uh, most of us carried a bruise or two from those. Uh, uh, events, but uh, I would like to remember those who suffered a little bit more uh, from among our colleagues, people like uh, Michael Wise, who had almost his finger torn off when they wanted to tear uh, uh, away his notebook, uh, Misha Glenny, who got uh, hit uh, over his head in May 1989 and had a concussion, but mostly Paula Buterini, who, uh, who was uh, heavily injured in, in uh, uh, November, on the November 17th uh, demonstration, 1989, uh, and others. And we were still quite uh, uh, well off, you know, other people like John Tagliabu, who also reported on some of the Prague events got shot in Temeshwara in December uh, 1989. So I just want you to know that uh, this was a, a part of the and parcel of the reporting, and uh, and this is why this is 
one of the phases of my life that I remember and will remember forever. So thank you all for being here. Thank you all for coming. And I will hand over uh, to another war reporter <laughs> of the younger generation, Jakub Santo. Is, uh, you know him from the Czech television. And before I give him the floor to introduce uh, our speakers, I will ask uh, uh, the DCM of the uh, Embassy of the United States, uh, who co-sponsored uh, this event, to uh, say a few words. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi. Um, hello. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Thanks uh, to you for being. Uh, I'm sure you're going to do an excellent panel. Um, I'm here on behalf of the U.S. government uh, to thank you all for continuing to talk about the important role that international media plays. And uh, it's a great opportunity to reflect on the role of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, um, and our role, the US government's role we've had to play uh, during the era leading up to 1989. Uh, I learned in pre preparing for this uh, a couple of facts, which you probably all knew, but I did not. And that's sort of the role that George Kennan had to play, both in Prague and uh, with the founding of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Uh, I guess he started his posting in Prague in 1938 and stuck around even after the Nazi occupation. And so Prague was sort of in his heart from the beginning of the Cold War. And I think Prague was also in his heart when they founded Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And I think it's an amazing thing that we have Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty now based in Prague. Uh, and I'm very proud to say, if they don't say it, I'll say it, that I saw that they won an award today, uh, an, a prominent uh, Edward R. Murrow Award, uh, to again demonstrate how important international journalism and this organization remains in this modern day. They gave me a lot of remarks to, to say about uh, 19, uh, the lead up to 1989, but I think you guys are gonna do an excellent job and you, sir, uh, did an excellent job touching on it. So I'd rather just say that I hope that we, uh, the U.S. government, can continue to support international journalists in the years to come. Uh, I think we continue to have a, a very relevant role to play, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. And Voice in, of America. And Voice of America. <laughs> in, uh, in, in, on these issues and in... Uh, advancing uh, free, independent journalism as we did in 1989. I think it remains very relevant today. So I'm going to leave it there because I think you guys are going to do a better job than I could uh, talking about the events leading up to 1989. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And I, I would be remiss in my duties if I also did not uh, acknowledge our other partner and that's the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, who uh, helped us with organizing this event and brought in uh, one of the very important uh, uh, speakers and uh, I think we have Jamie Fly, the uh, director of RFERL and Joanna Levison with us uh, today, so thank you for doing this too. And now Jakub, on to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I would like to start with uh, certainly uh, giving a little bit more information about our esteemed guests. And uh, I would like to f uh, also say thank you very much. I feel uh, privileged to be sitting here uh, with you, uh, gentlemen. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions that we're going to have. So I'll start with uh, uh, Russ Johnson, who is a History and Public Policy Fellow at Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and Senior Advisor at Radio for Europe Radio Liberty. Uh, Mr. Johnson was a senior executive uh, at the radio from 1988 to 2002, serving as director of Radio Free Europe and acting president and council of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. He was research fellow at the Hoover Institution from 2003 until 2000, 2016, as well as senior staff member of the RAND Corporation from 1969 till 1988. He has specialized in East European and Soviet security issues, and since 2002, he has advised Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, on the preservation of its archives, including those of the Czechoslovak Secret Service. 
Julian Nagle, uh, the other esteemed gentleman here on board, uh, uh, has studied Soviet bloc uh, since his university years, and also he studied Czech language, uh, which I can attest is fluent in. Uh, he was the Voice of America correspondent uh, uh, for the area since 1984 until 1994. And as, uh, as such, he, uh, uh, he covered the collapse of the communist rule in Eastern Europe, disintegration of the United States, Yugoslavia. No, not the United uh, States. Uh, sorry, not sorry, yet, sorry. Not yet. Sorry. No, 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 not really. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right, once again, uh, of the uh, USSR, of the Soviet Union, thank you very much, uh, of Yugoslavia and also of Czechoslovakia. Uh, as a senior editor and analyst for West Balkans Affairs, he worked in Radio for Europe, Radio uh, uh, Liberty in Prague uh, between 1996 and 2003. And from 2003, he has held various posts at the UN mission in Kosovo, including Chief Political Affairs Officer from 2007 until 2017, and since since then he has been researching also the files of the Czechoslovak secret police, which we'll definitely talk about. And uh, uh, myself, I work as a reporter of the international news uh, in uh, uh, Czech television. I've recently uh, come back from my post of uh, Middle Eastern correspondent, so I guess we'll try to, well, I'll try to find some, some, some sticking points in uh, uh, referring from uh, covering uh, moments, uh, let's say, of what was happening 30 years ago and in and, and, and last, and last uh, decades. Uh, I would like to start with a personal anecdote. Uh, in 1989, I was a kid uh, living in Moscow where my uh, mother worked for the organization called Comic-Con, which was a sort of uh, 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 economic union uh, between various communist countries, which in fact worked the way that Czechoslovakia was exporting its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, highly industrial, uh, uh, well, uh, such stuff as tractors and cars and other machinery to countries like Vietnam and Cuba. Cuba and from Cuba we got uh, unedible uh, sour oranges. So that's the way it worked. And in 1989, right before uh, the events in, in Prague, uh, I had the opportunity to see a pirated copy on VHS for the younger generation that is a cassette uh, thing that was at the time used for broadcast or for showing videos, wait, non-existent today. And I saw a pirated copy of uh, Top Gun, the first one, which was released in 1986. And it was, uh, uh, we didn't have any subtitles since it was pirated. It was, it just got a very bad voiceover in Russian. So, but still, you know, I was, I was as a kid, I was, 13 at the time, I was, uh, I was looking at that, way, you know, being astonished. And I said to myself, boy, would it not be great to see that once uh, with my own eyes? Well, guess what? This anchor comes from the board of uh, US carrier Harry S. Truman, uh, where I was able uh, to film uh, the, the war against Islamic State. So that's one of uh, the living proofs, you know, what, what has changed uh, a guy from uh, Eastern Bloc, you know, being able to 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 film their own board. Uh, so that leads to uh, to a question. Since you gentlemen were at the time uh, much better informed than me, uh, and I guess you you had the luck to see Top Gun without the terrible Russian uh, voiceover. <laughs> uh, when was the time where you personally saw that something is happening that the Iron Curtain may not there be? Forever was it uh, the events in Poland in between 1980 1981? Was it later on in 88 the events again in Poland in Hungary? What was the moment where you saw that maybe the world really is changing? Well, it sounds like the question I was asked on my oral exam for my masters: <laughs> When did the Cold War really begin? Um, solidarity was unique, there's nothing comparable to it, but it was put down by, uh, with force, albeit not with Soviet force, but to avoid Soviet involvement. Um, the Pope played a key role even before, Pope John Paul II, even before uh, solidarity was born. And he continued to play a, a role, perhaps an even bigger role after mar martial law ended. Uh, and so what I witnessed in the streets of um, Dinya, I think it was, or Sopot, just north of Dansk, where he had a massive 
um, a mass, open air mass, that he then flew off uh, by helicopter, leaving a huge crowd. But he, before he flew off, he provoked the crowd. The crowd was passive because they'd been under, I mean, the country had been under uh, essentially police, military rule for years. Um, and he let the word solidarity slip in his speech. And there was no reaction. Maybe a couple of people applauded. He said, I said solidarity. Isn't it a beautiful word, solidarity? And then all of a sudden, not only did people chant the word solidarity, but from under their coats and out of their bags came huge banner, banners, Solidarność, um, for various regions of Poland, Mazowsze, and whatever. Um, and it was an amazing scene in whatever it was, 86 or so. And then subsequently, of course, there was a usual clash between protesters and the police, with the protesters chanting, uh, Nebi Polaka Bądź Polakiem, don't beat the pole, be a pole. Um, but Poland dragged on for some time before 1988 with the start of the round table talks. Hungary, it was, a, it was a, more of a, a bureaucratic change, but it, it, they, it, something happened in the Hungarian parliament that was noticed by almost no one but the US embassy. I got my information over lunch from, from a US embassy officer. I, mean, I think that was in 86, it could have been 85. There was a move in parliament by the uh, Hungarian Socialist People's Workers Party or whatever it was called at the time um, to have uh, new residences for the members of the Politburo financed by the state budget. And the MPs said, what? What are you thinking? No. And they voted it down. This was key. This was the first chink in the, in, in, of light. And this was then followed by a very tedious process of um, expansion of pluralism, what was called political pluralism, which I didn't understand what it really meant at the time, but it was allowing different views uh, within the one-party state. This led eventually, uh, after um, Janos Kadar uh, gave up power, and he was pushing not to or threatening not to until the last minute at the party conference where his career came to uh, an expected end. Um, finally, in, uh, on October 23rd, 1989, uh, Matyas Surush, the speaker of the Hungarian parliament, went out on the, on the balcony of the parliament building and spoke to a lunchtime crowd estimated at 100,000 in the square below um, and declared Hungary a republic without adjectives, I no longer a people's republic. And then the crowd <coughs> broke out in the uh, no national anthem of Hungary, God uh, save or God, God protect Hungary for she has suffered long enough. And I went back to the hotel to write up my story, and I wept. I wept because by that point, uh, we'd seen the elections in Poland. Solidarity won all 100 seats in the Polish Senate, uh, and the majority of seats in the same, the lower house. Hungary was suddenly a republic, the Republic of Hungary, not the People's Republic. And here in Czechoslovakia, what we were seeing, what I had been seeing since March 1988 was a series of occasional demonstrations that attracted a maximum of 10,000 participants. And while the uh, police tactics were dependent on orders from above, from whether it was the municipal party chief or uh, someone else in the party rather than um, political hierarchy, um, 
not all the demonstrations were violent, violently suppressed, but most were. Um, and the situation seemed somewhat hopeless. In October 1989, a group of dissidents met after the demonstration, after the 28th of October demonstration, the 71st anniversary of uh, the creation of the Czechoslovak state, to discuss where do we go from here? Can we now create some sort of a civic movement forum? Um, and I was present by accident. I didn't know this meeting was going to take place, but I went to my usual source and um, the decision was made that it was too early. 10,000 is not enough to bring down a government. Um, and they went off and informed Václav Havel of this. And then came the 17th of November. I didn't get here until the 19th because my bosses at VOA thought I should stay in East Berlin that weekend. Uh, but that's another story. Um, I was uh, greeted at the uh, Hotel Yalta on arrival in the afternoon of the 19th with the words of the, uh, from the um, receptionist who was an STB informer who said, a little late this time, Mr. Nagley. And I said, well, that remains to be seen. Uh, I had, driving down from East Berlin, uh, picked up hitchhikers in Teplice who were agog about what they had experienced in the previous days in the, in the demonstrations or protests in the ice hockey stadium there. Uh, so I was alert to cha big changes. And then I went to see Peter Uhl, because he had been the source of the reports about the death of Martin Schmidt, a uh, student uh, in the 17th of November demonstration. Uh, Uhl said, uh, told me that he was uh, coming to believe uh, that um, he had been misled, that there was a provocation, that there are three Martin Schmidts registered at the university and they're all alive and well, and uh, that he was now going to go confirm that in fact this was a, a provocation, but that we shouldn't leave his flat together uh, for safety reasons. So I left first, and after, when he left, he was detained and spent a few days then in police custody. I then headed back down towards the square and ran into Standa Milota, the husband of Vlasta Hramostova, who said, it's begun. You can't believe what's going on down in the square. It's full. I went down, and I'd never seen anything like it. This was not a crowd of 10,000. This was a crowd of close to 100,000, from museum down to Mustek. Uh, and the crowd then moved down, eventually down the square. There was no secret police activity. They were there. I recognized them. I mean, I'd been here on and off for 10 years, I knew many, many of the faces. They were waiting for orders. Nothing happened. And um, the crowd eventually uh, made it to the National Theater. And the police had not blocked the bridges as they had at previous demonstrations. The crowd went across the, the river for the first time. And uh, as they approached Petchin Hill, Suddenly, the police arrived by the busloads and surrounded the crowd, which were mostly young people, mostly students, but not, not exclusively. By this time, it was dark. It gets dark very quickly in, in November. And um, there was a standoff. It didn't last long, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Uh, the stu student demonstrators um, made clear that they did not want a repeat of what had happened on Friday the 17th, that they should be allowed to uh, disperse peacefully without going through a cordon of, of uh, truncheon-wielding cops. And they, we were allowed to all allowed to disperse. I witnessed this from the um, spot on Pechin, where at the base of Pechin, where the uh, Obram Zobek statues uh, are commemorating the victims of communism. Um, 
I then walked towards the castle, towards Malostranska um, Namnosti, uh, curious where the police cordon would be, and it was on Malostranska Namnosti. It was the Lidova Militsa there, backed up by regular police. The Lidova Militsa and or the regular police had, had dogs. You could not enter the square. I mean, I could turn right and go to Charles Bridge, but no further, certainly not up to the castle. So then it had begun. Um, the next morning, Monday, uh, the 20th, for the first and last time, there was a news conference in Václav Havel's apartment. It was a zoo, uh, because there, there must have been close to 100 journalists uh, and cameramen, and they were standing on furniture. It, 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 I felt sorry for him, uh, but it was, it was fascinating. And um, uh, Rita Klimova translated into English. Uh, and I walked then down along the embankment towards the next con news conference by Walter Komarek. Uh, and I spoke to Misha Glenny. Uh, it snowed overnight lightly. It was now sunny. And I said, oh, if it goes at this pace, place, if, if, if things go at this pace, I'll be able to move here in the spring. My dream of finally living in Prague will, will, will have come true. And he said, well, not so fast, Julian. So I'll stop there. <laughs> There's no one simple mm -hmm. answer. <clears throat> there were individual events in specific countries. You know, I haven't mentioned Bulgaria or Romania, mm -hmm. both of which I covered, let alone Yugoslavia, which was not in the Soviet bloc, another special case. Uh, and East Germany, of course, was yet another case. But for Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, obviously, they were very different. And the key thing I, I just want to uh, impress on everyone here was, why did the crowds turn out by the hundreds of thousands in November 89 and not in such numbers, nearly such numbers before? It was the absence of fear, the end of fear. Uh, there were, people still feared on the 28th of October. Um, what changed was that the Berlin Wall was opened and um, the Soviets did not react, nor did these Germans, nor did anyone else react with force. And hence, uh, that combined with the outrage about the false news of the death of Martin Schmidt got the people into the street in such numbers that the um, Politburo, the Presidium of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, resigned en masse. Uh, on the 24th, then their replacements were no better, uh, and, the, and the public was even more outraged, hence the demonstrations on Letna uh, on the 25th and 26th, and the booing of, of uh, Ladislav Adamets. Um, Julian was um, able to follow all of uh, that that you heard um, on the ground, and uh, I'm envious. Um, I was um, I was um, watching all this from a bit of a distance. Um, I had come back to Munich in September of 1988 as as RV director. Before that, I'd been working at this American think tank, the Rand Corporation. From there, I could travel around Eastern Europe. Um, but the last big trip I took, actually, in those days was 1985, and things had not really, of course, we'd had the whole experience in Poland, but things had not yet begun to, to move in the way that uh, Julian has described. Um, if we look, look uh, at you know, what changed when and why, um, we certainly have to give credit to Mikhail Gorbachev, who by 1988 made it... Um, uncomfortably clear to the communist leaderships in Eastern Europe that um, the Soviet army was not going to save their skin one more time. I do think that could have happened in 1981, 1982 with solidarity, but by 1988, 89, it was not going to happen again. And that upset the whole um, set of relationships between the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and between the East European regimes and the 
and the citizens. Um, when I came uh, to Munich, as I said, in September of 88, um, what did I expect? I knew things were changing, um, but I certainly had no idea of what would happen in the next year. Um, as it was easier to travel from VOA into Eastern Europe, it was impossible from RFERL, um, although Hungary was beginning uh, to be possible, but I thought, okay, well, I'll have to give up travel in the region. Um, what changed? Um, already in um, October of 88, um, I was as basically from my old capacity at the think tank at a conference in uh, East Berlin with East German uh, political and military leaders. And it was clear that they had lost their way. They were trying to think how they could have an independent East German security doctrine. I mean, nonsense. Um, they, were, they were lost. Um, and this was uh, already then in, in 88. Um, so things mushroomed, particularly in Hungary, already in May of 1989. I traveled with Laszlo Rabanski, who was director of the Hungarian service, to Budapest. Um, we had a bit of a delay at the airport because uh, um, Mr. Rabanski was still on the blacklist, um, so it took a while to get him into the country, but it worked. I mean, we were, after all, going to visit the foreign minister, Geza Yasensky, um, to discuss opening an RFE, RL bureau in Budapest, which then happened in, uh, in October. And then, as I mentioned, by, uh, by the fall of 1989, um, so this is before the Berlin Wall fell and before um, the uh, Velvet Revolution, but after the semi-free election in Poland, uh, we were in Warsaw to, again, discuss opening a bureau to meet the Mazowiecki government, uh, to meet uh, Lech Wałęsa in, uh, in, uh, in Gdańsk. Um, all that was changing, and um, the work of RFRL was changing, because um, how did one cover a, 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 a rigidly controlled um, information space in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a very authoritarian government? Well, with all kinds of ways and, and, and sub, uh, substitute ways, a, a research capacity, monitoring of the official media. Um, we were fortunate. I mean, it was... Uh, it was, one re it was the investment in RFERL, the investment in the Czechoslovak service, which had, I mean, there were 70 um, Czechoslovak, Czechs and Slovaks working in Munich, not all, of course, broadcasters and editors, but a very large team. Journalists able to um, get all around uh, Western Europe and, and, and the rest of the world to report. And then what changed were the... Um, they, uh, not just the uh, individual reports of, of dissidents uh, and opposition figures uh, in the Czech, uh, speaking of, the, of, the, of Czechoslovakia then, but uh, the more organized efforts, the independent press agency of Peter Uhl that uh, Julian's referred to. Um, and not only did the, um, uh, th these more organized sources of, of independent and dissident information start providing input, um, we also, and this, so this was a new relationship between the broadcasters and the audience, um, we started getting um, formal editorial um, program suggestions. Um, there in the summer of 89, um, the uh, spokespersons of Charter 77 sent a long memoranda with um, uh, what were actually quite helpful suggestions on how the program could be um, improved. There should be more time for voices from Czechoslovakia. Uh, we were neglecting this or that part of the international coverage. Um, that's a new, that was a new situation uh, uh, to deal with. Um, and then came uh, a couple of events that uh, uh, really did, did help change the world in which RFRL played a role. Uh, one was the famous um, speech of um, Secretary, General Secretary Yakish um, in July of 19. 
89, uh, this, this incoherent babble where he declared Czechoslovakia would be the last post in the fence of communism or something like that, recorded, I think, by a journalist of, of Czechoslovak TV and then smuggled out, widely played on, on, on uh, RFRL, probably on uh, uh, VOA. Um, they ridiculed uh, uh, Yakish, and I mean, he re ridiculed himself. Uh, that cer certainly had an effect. Then came um, uh, the November 17th demonstrations, widely covered, um, including um, the inadvertent um, uh, reporting of the death of Martin uh, Schmidt, who of course was the man who, who did not die. Um, and there's a story about journalism, I suppose, because uh, the first uh, report came to RFRL from um, Peter Ohl, from the, the press agency. Um, a certain Michael Jantowski, the Reuters correspondent, uh, put it to Reuters, and Reuters carried it, VOA carried it. RFRL actually sat on it for a day, looking for a second source, found a second source they thought. Yes, he's dead, carried the story. Well, he wasn't. Uh, it, w it, it remains unclear to this day, was this kind of a provocation or it was just sort of um, lost, uh, you know, a miscommunication in a very chaotic, uh, chaotic time. Um, that inadvertent false news, if we call it that, certainly contributed to the um, uh, um, strengthening of the demonstrations and the, the numbers in the way that uh, that Julian has described, and then the final point I'd make is uh, as uh, Julian Julian was there in Novenceslav Square, um, somehow the uh, check and it's a sign that the system was crumbling, um, that the system ha was falling apart. That the uh, Pavel Pahacek, director of the Czechoslovak service, applied for a visa. There were, a couple of, there were a couple of minor events, a religious ceremony, something like that. Um, and lo and behold, got it. So he arrived in Prague on the 20th of, uh, of November, was able to provide coverage from uh, of the first, uh, of, of day two to four uh, of the demonstrations in Venceslav Square from, from the balcony. Um, and uh, this reporting from outside was really the only um, large-scale source of information on what was happening until, I think, on day four, uh, Czechoslovak television saw uh, the future change sides and started covering um, the uh, demonstrations in, in, in detail. And, and the co of course, the coda to that is that, um, and, and I, I should say, um, I knew, of course, that Pahacek was going to Prague, but the first I heard that he had succeeded in what he was trying to do was uh, listening to his reports from um, the balcony of Ences above Venceslav Square on, my, on, on middle wave on my car radio in Munich, driving, driving into the office. The coda is that when um, uh, Pahacek went in to extend his visa, <laughs> they said, what are you doing here? And they kicked him out. Well... By the time he got to the border post on the way to, to, to um, back to Germany, uh, Jakish was already going and the uh, system had changed. He got back to Munich and two days later came back to Prague. Well, Jolien, you mentioned uh, the field work. Uh, uh, in 2004 and 2014, while we were covering the events in Kiev and in the, both the, 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 the revolutions, which eventually the, the second one turned pretty violent, we... Uh, we had a very well two very important weapons for our work. One is a cell phone, and the second one is a cell phone connected to internet. So the spreading of information of all information, including misinformation from all the sites that were that were there, was much easier, much quicker. Of course, and also the organization of the protests and stuff like that was much easier for us. So we didn't have much trouble with the sources. Quite the contrary, way too many sources. How to squeeze it into a report? That was not the case, obviously, in the, in the, at the end of the 80s. Uh, how did the real field work look like, especially when you had those nice gentlemen and ladies working for the state secret uh, police behind your tail all the time? Right. Um, yeah, they were ubiquitous. Um, they weren't only hotel personnel. They were also people I considered my friends. Uh, these people worked in the capacity those that I came into contact with were in the capacity of informers, agenti, check. Uh, 
then there were the uh, the fourth people from the fourth department of state security uh, surveillance, people from the second department, uh, which was uh, counterintelligence. They made life difficult um, at times. But we'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the secret police aside for now and focus on how did I get the story. I had on my initial trips in as a VOA correspondent in 1985, a, a portable computer, too big to be called a laptop, a screen that was not much bigger than this glass, um, and uh, you took the telephone and put it into a, a cradle, a built-in modem in this uh, contraption. And I always traveled with two Sony 5000 cassette recorders, which were rather heavy, but they were cassette, at least they weren't tape. Um, and you, I would uh, write my story on the computer, I'd record it, and uh, and or mix it, that's why I had two, so I could mix in some what was called actuality, some elements of an interview or of a crowd chanting or praying or whatever, um, and then ask the hotel receptionist to kindly call VOA either in London or in Washington. On one occasion, while covering a pilgrimage uh, in uh, near Levoča in Slovakia. I was staying at a hotel in Spiska Nova Ves. Flames leapt out of my portable computer. Um, whether this was intentional on the part of the STB that they simply decided to gun the engines, as it were, uh, send through a, a, I don't know. They did not understand computers. That much is clear from reading the secret police files the notion of what a laptop was, which is what I received to replace this, and which had a capacity of two 13-line stories, I think, the first one I got. Um, they described this right up until the 19, late 1980s as a, well, I just, they quoted me, basically, the border guards and the hotel person. This is a, an electronic um, typewriter. I assume you all know what a typewriter is, <laughs> Satsi story. Um, an electronic typewriter, which he connects to the telephone somehow and presses a button and in a matter of minutes, minutes in those days, it really took minutes for a story to go through, not, not instantaneous, uh, woof, it's gone. So um, sometimes it was impossible to get through. Somehow the, tele, the telephone operator at the hotel couldn't, we couldn't dial directly from the hotel. Uh, I had bigger problems elsewhere in the region, especially in Bulgaria, but that was intentional on, on the part of the state. Um, I tended to take sensitive material, interviews with Václav Havel, for instance, out in a, on a cassette in my pocket on the assumption that uh, I was not going to be frisked. They searched my stuff usually, but they, uh, once I, 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 I was under surveillance, I was, had a file, there was a file on me from, from early 1981, although I didn't start with VOA until 85, 84, uh, and I received accreditation in 85. Um, so I'd, I'd been through a lot of baggage searches, and I had to empty my pockets on occasion. But not, as a VOA correspondent, they didn't go as far as emptying my pockets. Um, when Václav Havel was released from prison on the 17th of May, 89, uh, four months after his uh, detention, um, I interviewed him. I drove up immediately from Vienna to Prague, interviewed him in his flat, and then um, for once I decided to send the story out from Prague and I used the uh, office of the Italian news agency ANSA. I mean, I was 
whether I was under surveillance that day or not is sort of immaterial. I may not have been by then for the simple reason that the STB had decided early in 2000, uh, sorry, early in 1989, that after investigating me for espionage for seven years, they found no evidence that I was a spy and they had wasted too much money, uh, state money, in following me around with too many people and cars, etc. And so my file was transferred. It was no longer a so-called signal file, Sydney Svazek, uh, but I was a Proverjovana Osoba. Uh, someone who had been uh, screened. So I was a known quantity. The file was kept for 10 years, was supposed to be kept for 10, 10 years, but uh, the constant surveillance essentially ended already in March or so. Um, so I sent the story out, drove back to Vienna at the border. The border guard said to me, you heard Havel's been released. I said, yeah, I know. I just spoke to him. I interviewed him. I said, yeah, you have the cassette? I said, yeah, we were just listening to the interview actually on the radio. <laughs> Good. So he, he seemed a, a little crestfallen. Um, but yeah, taking cassettes out, mm -hmm. for instance, the uh, cassette, which I did not tape, I hasten to add, of the uh, demonstration on Good Friday in Bratislava, on Vyazoslava uh, von Amnesty, um, where someone recorded the police communications, 90 minutes or so of police communications, because uh, FM radio didn't exist, well, existed, but on a different frequency from Western Europe. And the police were using a West, essentially what, a frequency that was used for regular FM in the West. So it was easy with a Sony um, shortwave or multi shortwave AM FM to record to listen in to police communications in this country. I mean, they were they were dim. Let's be, let's be clear about that. Um, so someone had recorded these communications, which showed a panic-stricken not only police but leadership, because the, the the police were receiving orders from the Slovak Republic leadership from a command post in the Hotel Carlton. Uh, and you'd hear things like, turn, damn it, turn these sirens off. They're driving us crazy. We can't focus. Or uh, where those Betty, Betty were a uh, code name for water, uh, water cannon. They should have been here a long time ago. Or there's a reporter down there. He's writing something. What should I do? Detain him immediately. Take him away. And so one was hearing this nonsense for an hour, and so much like the uh, an hour and a half, so much like the uh, cool Plotje speech of of um, uh, Miloš Jakes, uh, so to this recording, which Jan Chanogurski gave me, and I still don't know who, who recorded it, I boiled it down, um, and it to quote Alexander Dubček, whom I interviewed a number of times in the course of 88 and 89, and already in 87, um, this showed the regime for what it really was. Of course, uh, I just wanted to come back. Oh. There we go. Come back to something Julian had said. Uh, uh, people lost their fear. And this is what was developing in the 80s. And um, it's hard to pin down uh, what are the most important causal factors. The system um, was demonstrably um, unable to perform um, economically. Um, travel from Central and Eastern Europe to the West had increased, and so people, they weren't leaving, they were traveling and coming back. People could see with their own eyes what was going on. Um, I remember um, back in uh, California watching, there, there was some, some, some documentary done on Hungary, it must have been in early 88 or something, interviewing young Hungarians. And uh, the Western journalists kind of presum presuming and leading question, you know, things are not so bad here, are they, in Hungary? Things going pretty well for you, aren't they? And I remember this one uh, marvelous interview with, with he's, he's interviewing one young uh, Hungarian woman, and she kind of 
scowls and she says, you know, the question, aren't things uh, pretty good here? And she kind of scowls and says, yeah, well, I suppose in comparison with Bangladesh, <laughs> with no, no disrespect meant to Bangladesh. Um, and it, it was Mar um, um, Mark Watinsky, director of the Polish Service, who said in early 88, um, nobody is afraid to talk to us anymore, by which he meant people in Poland had lost their fear. In 1988, RFE Polish Service could call into Poland and talk to 200 prominent non-regime or semi-regime people um, who were willing to be interviewed in their own voices with their own names. Um, people lost, the, the regime was falling, the, the, the um, forces of repression were crumbling. It explains how a Pahacha could get, could get a visa and a lot of other things that could happen. And once they had the shock of, of, of Gorbachev, we're not going to save you anymore. That's when things, that's when I think the momentum really, um, really increased. So um, for me, uh, it's not 89, it's 1987 when it really, really begins. The, uh, you've described the, 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 the very many, uh, the, 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 the various cracks that they started to, 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 to appear in what used to look like a monolithic block. Uh, then uh, Mr. Gorbachev appeared after a, a quick succession of, of three uh, state funerals in Moscow, which, which I remember here, uh, 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 lived really close. And I remember that uh, it, it seems like during all my childhood there was a huge black flag here because like the, the first, you know, then the second, then the third one. And then eventually they decided that maybe it's time to have a new generation of a leader, not to spend so much money on the parades on the, on the, on the Red Square in Moscow. Uh, then, so, so when Gorbachev appeared in 85 and by 86, he actually uh, told what had been heard already by the leaders in Eastern Europe at the Varsha it's your business. But it was meant completely different than when, when Brezhnev said it uh, before. And it really meant it's your business, we have our own troubles. So, so when, when that started, uh, then uh, it, it appeared that uh, with the events in 88 in Hungary, uh, in, uh, in Poland, obviously, that there was this sort of uh, post-Stalinist bloc led by the East Germans, uh, the Romanians, and unfortunately also the leadership here in Czechoslovakia that, well, we'll, sort it, uh, we'll wait till they sort it out with that guy in Moscow, and then we'll wait, you know, but we'll sit, sit down the, uh, the, the, the hurricane, which fortunately for us uh, uh, did, not, uh, did not happen. Uh, how difficult was it actually uh, for you, Julian, on the ground, and also for Euros as uh, the the general uh, in in charge of, of the news uh, to make it easier to understand for uh, your domestic audience as well for the international audience that there is no such thing as a monolithic block that actually each of the country of the sort of so -called small communist countries is a different story and each of them is a is a is a is a possible crack in the whole block of uh, of Soviet Union supremacy over at least one third of the world. Well. Um... It was clear to me, having studied Eastern Europe, having traveled extensively, that uh, each country was different. There were obviously similarities. Um, they were all police states, and let's not kid ourselves, Hungary was, as Miklos Harasti called it, a velvet prison. Um, and uh, I was under surveillance there and photographed with a camera hidden in a leather cigarette case in the parking lot one evening in Solnok on my way to the Romanian border. So, you know, there were, simi there were clear similarities in that sense. Um, the frustration level differed widely. I picked up hitchhikers wherever I went. Um, I wouldn't do that today, but back then I felt fairly confident. Um, unfortunately, many of these hitchhikers then had a rendezvous with the police immediately thereafter. Sure. Just, well, I circled the block and they were already being stuffed into a car, whether it was in Prague or in, in a provincial Romanian town, it happened. Um, but having an anonymous source, usually young, usually a student, able to speak openly for a couple of hours in the car between Brno or Bratislava and Prague, for instance, one found out a lot that you didn't read in the Rude Pravo. 
or in Samastad. Um, so, yes, there were, there were huge differences, and there were always differences. Well, as a student in 1977, I studied Polish in Kraków, and the fear that one felt so palpably here then in the 70s was of such a uh, reduced nature in Poland. Um, the black market obviously flourished, and here it existed, but you know everything with a little uh, false de decency, uh, false modesty, and and not so blatant. Um, the situation in Romania was dire um, throughout the eighties, incomparably worse than anywhere else economically, incomparably worse because uh, Nicolae Ceausescu had uh, decided to stop um, borrowing from the West and the country really wasn't producing much of anything that anyone wanted. And um, he eventually had to literally turn the lights out. Uh, we get this now in California, but for other reasons. <laughs> um, uh, and you could walk down streets in Budapest, in, in Bucharest, and yeah, the, the, there was very little light. Um, there was a limit on the uh, wattage of the light, the sole light bulb per room or per flat, depending on the number of people. Uh, and there was interference, which you see, have seen in China in more recent years, uh, controlling um, whether women were. Uh, using birth control, whether they were going to have babies. They wanted more, as opposed to China, which has wanted less. But there was an interference in their, their private lives and their sexual lives with mon monthly inspections to basically prevent abortions. I was hungry. Um, in Bulgaria, uh, there was an active attempt, uh, for more than an attempt, an active policy from 1984 onwards to forcibly assimilate the Turkish minority, which made up roughly 10% of the population, they had to change their Turkish or Arab uh, uh, names, first and last names, to Bulgarian Slavic Christian names. If they didn't choose one on their own, it was assigned to them. Uh, there were clashes, violent clashes with the police, much of which went unreported because it was a closed society and the Turks to a great extent lived in in uh, the border zone along the Greek and Turkish border and the border zone was expanded in the process uh, to 50 kilometers or so. Um, uh, whole areas even in the, in the interior were closed off. I was detained three times in the space of a week in 1985 while trying to enter uh, Turkish communities to get the story out. Um, and that was, in the end, a major factor in the collapse of communism in Bulgaria, uh, because the situation eventually blew up in the spring of uh, 1989. Uh, Bulgaria started uh, f expelling uh, people they considered to be troublemakers, young men, putting them on a train, and they were living at the Sudbahnhof in Vienna for weeks. And then Todor Zhivkov announced, the head of the Bulgarian Communist Party, uh, announced uh, on the 4th or 5th of June, uh, it coincided with the elections in Poland and Tiananmen, uh, or everything happened within 24 hours. He announced that he was opening the border and that all people who claim that they're Turks, but really are uh, Bulgarians who were forcibly Islamicized, in his view, uh, could leave and go to Turkey. And uh, there was a mass exodus, um, which became a destabilizing element in the country because it was, among other things, dependent on ex exports of tobacco, which were in ethnic Turkish areas. And anyway, so there were differences everywhere. Um, that the Soviet Union could never, never solve. And Gorbachev made this clear at the CMEA summit 
Comic-Con Summit in Sofia. And presumably he must have said something on his very quick visit to Prague, which came before that in the, it must have been early 86. Uh, I came in, I learned of it that Gorbachev was coming into town or had just arrived. And I as always had a fresh visa in my passport and I drove up uh, in a snowstorm and there were no hotel rooms available and I was put up by a, a second secretary from the US Embassy. Um, first and last time that happened. I, I mean, it was very kind of him to do it, but we weren't supposed to be accepting such favors. Uh, there was nothing else. To describe as, as a journalist, what could I actually find out under those circumstances? I was totally dependent on state media. Um, there was no other way of finding out what went on at a Warsaw Pact hastily arranged summit. Um, in contrast, in Sofia, uh, there was a press center. We didn't learn anything, but at least there was a press center. So there, was a, there were telephones and we could send a story out that was based on BTA, the Bulgarian Telegraph Agency. The whole... Um whole point, I suppose, of, uh, of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty was that um, every country was different. This was not some kind of um, homogeneous Soviet bloc. You, you got that kind of caricature sometimes in, uh, in American popular treatment of the, of the area. But, uh, of course, the, uh, the broadcasts were all organized on a country basis. Um, and when we come to this period we're talking about, as ferment um, developed in one country and then another, um, one of the emphases in editorial policy was um, what came under the, the jargon of cross-reporting, meaning uh, to let the Czechoslovak audience, Czech and Slovak audience know what was happening in Poland and in Hungary, and so on and so forth. So there was a very... Um, um, a detailed internal mechanism um, to um, be able to share um, information from one service in one country um, to the other. And uh, a lot of that, I mean, that was, I think that played a very important role in, in, in 1989, um, letting, um, letting um, uh, Romanians and uh, Czechs and Slovaks know about um, uh, you know the the um, the massive taking of um, asylum by the East German travelers in the West German embassies around the the region, um, and 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 on and on. Um, the other another point would be that, um, and it goes back to one could see all these trends underway, and yet to to actually anticipate a specific development in a specific um, time is uh, difficult, if not impossible. Um, and take the case of Romania, which was, of course, the last to, to, to change here in 1989, and unfortunately, uh, the exception to peaceful change, because there we had the violence. And right up until, um, until November, right up until December 17th, um, all the, uh, I think, the general consensus and certainly the thinking in in Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Munich, was that um, things will be, uh, it'll be the same old story, at least for quite a while in, uh, in, uh, in Romania. There was, um, uh, right before December 17th, a series of program plans, which, <laughs> which assumed that even at the end of the year, kind of New Year's Day programming, um, the programs would focus on uh, um, what was happening in, in uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Then came uh, Timisoar, and then came um, the people in the streets, and then came violence, and that changed everything. And uh, overnight, um, the system fell. It seems to me one of the most uh, poignant images that uh, all dictators should take a look at is Ceausescu up on the balcony, thinking he can uh, somehow control the crowd. And then you see He's not. And then you see the reaction on his face. I think every dictator and autocrat ought to have a picture of that in front of them. I, I would add, though, and it tends to be forgotten, 
there was already unrest before Timishwara, two years earlier in Brashov. Um, and that I was in Brashov by chance because I'd had a car accident. Uh, and so I had to wait for parts to be delivered from Vienna. And I left the day before the trouble erupted. But something was brewing, and I was more closely monitored there than perhaps at any other time. Um, before we uh, we give uh, a chance also to the audience, I have well, let's let's move back uh, back to to Prague, to Czechoslovakia, and to the very building we're sitting in. When did Václav Havel appear on your radar, and when was the moment you understood that he will be the unifier of the small yet fractured uh, uh, groups of uh, Czechoslovak opposition? Well, the name, I was familiar with the name already as a student in the 1970s um, until I was a fully accredited correspondent. I did not dare knock on the door of dissidents because it might be my last trip to Czechoslovakia for a few years. Um, but I interviewed him, I believe in, at the beginning of 86 for the first time, might have been 85. He received the Erasmus of Rotterdam Award, I guess it was 86. And a few months, I mean, I re interviewed him. Hmm? Yeah, I interviewed him before the formal award ceremony, which he didn't attend because he worried that he would end up like uh, a few other, some other of his um, fellow Charter 77 signers not being able to allow, uh, travel home. Um, but he already knew he was getting it, and uh, he thought very carefully was on what he should say. Only once he arrived, at, uh, how should I put it? It was conspiratorial, the meeting. He didn't know who, who he was going to meet. Uh, it was arranged through friends and through his brother, and we met at Zdenia Kurbanek's flat, which was near where Havel was living at the time. Uh, in Prague 6, and he uh, came by uh, ostensibly for coffee, and there I was, and I'd seen him before from a distance, but I hadn't actually spoken to him, and I explained what I, want, what I wanted, and he said, okay, let me think this through. I don't want this to be the last interview, and I don't want to spend the, the evening answering questions in Bartolomei Ska. So he he um, thought about it for a couple of minutes, and then he, he made his statement. And subsequently, I interviewed him uh, any number of times in his flat uh, in Hradecek as well. Uh, and he was always very gracious about it. I destroyed accidentally an alarm clock in his flat because it was too close to the microphone, and I put it on a high shelf and fell down. Um, uh, his wife, Olga, um, guarded his privacy and his time. Uh, and on more than one occasion, she said, oh, Vasek's very busy. I don't think he can see you now. And then he could say, who's at the door? And she said, oh, it's Nagley from Voice of America. Let him in, let him in. And so he found the time, and he was always uh, able to, to encapsulate what needed to be said in relatively little time. He also uh shared his views on what america voice of america should be doing what was missing too much sports in his view but that was because pavel pachacek who before he went to rfrl headed the czechoslovak service was a sports uh reporter um too much yeah too much sports was his main uh view uh, main main complaint and uh, too much about the hit parade and he should know he, he wanted to know exactly when the political uh elements uh, ivan medek and so on were going to be on and he liked the the um fact that voa had begun broadcasting editorials which uh, i and many others despised because they were the views of the reagan administration uh, they were partisan and um, did not enhance, in my view, uh, VOA's image. Uh, but on the contrary, he wanted to know what the US government was thinking, and this was one way of him, uh, to find, for him to find out. Um, it was not until 89, 
on the 10th of December with, with Havel speaking uh, from the balcony, the Melanthrich balcony, uh, and declaring his famous uh, oft quoted um, uh, truth and, and uh, love must, uh, must uh, prevail over um, lies and hatred. Uh, that I think it was John Talibu who said to me, standing next to me, you know, they're talking about Havel being elected president. I said, come off it, you're joking. And he said, no, seriously. I said, well, yeah, it's a great idea, but is it going to pass? I mean, um, that was a big leap, still on the 10th. And yet, on the 29th or 30th, he was uh, inaugurated, and I was in the Vladislav Hall. <laughs> and I spoke to the two granddaughters of Tomasz Masaryk, Anna and Herberta, who were there too, and they said, just look around. Only the best people are here. She, they were pointing to the people in the, in the back, not the members of the parliament. Um, that yeah, This was a tremendous change, and there were great unknowns still at that point. Um, but the, the, the transformation or the making, making the impossible real only happened then in December. Just to add, yes, of course. Um, um, I guess from, from the beginning of Charter 77, um, lots of Havel was uh, um, a, a regular um, feature subject of the, of the programming in the the RFRL Czechoslovak service. Um, of course, um, an RFRL correspondent could not um, come to um, Czechoslovakia and do a personal interview. So it's all, um, if you look at the programming summaries, dissident sources report, you know, or so you, you, you're not going to get named correspondents or named sources, but you're getting, getting the information. Just to add, kind of parenthetically, uh, um, from Václav Havel's earlier history, I came across a, a letter. I don't know if this is widely um, um, observed or not. I, I came across a letter um, from um, the fall of 1968 from Václav Havel to a um, correspondent in America in which he's taking a great exception to the Moscow agreement, to the compromise that the Dubček government was forced to make with the Soviet authorities in that point, I, just as a, as, a, as a point of it. Finally, I mean, one can't, from, from RFRL, one can't mention the name Václav Havel without acknowledging that, um, Vats, without Václav Havel, uh, RFRL would not be um, based in Prague today. His, his, his uh, role was not only um, instrumental, it was, it was crucial, and uh, we're grateful for that. Well, we have 15 minutes exactly left, so is there any question? Please. Well, is it on? It's totally brought back memories for me because I was um, in Prague with a, a producer from BBC Newsnight uh, to make a program which could never happen anyway. Um, um, and we arrived on the 9th of November, stayed at the Intercontinental, put the, um, I must say as a, uh, <coughs> to start that the Hungarian was extremely skeptical about uh, what was happening in uh, that there was any anything going to happen in this country at that time his thesis was that things are things have shifted in hungary uh, what we heard this evening uh, poland uh, and things weren't going to move here um, i joined the team in july of 89 went to the czech service and the bbc uh, and had a good look at the Lidovinovini uh, and other uh, dissident publications. And, uh, and I'd also worked with uh, Willem Prechan on uh, the uh, 
uh, Nikolik Slov few words statement that was being signed by all, well, I say all and sundry, but very civic, significant members of civil society during, during the summer. And we arrived in, in, uh, in November, uh, on November the 9th, I, I, was, I was supposed to go and set up um, a program for their filming in January of 1990 um, to show that things weren't going to happen here. And uh, so watching the TV in the Intercontinental on, uh, on 9th November, we were watching people dancing on the Berlin Wall. The following morning, we had, to, we had a, uh, a meeting with the representative of the government at that time, a certain Mr. Pavel. And uh, we went down, and uh, the Hungarian producer said, oh, uh, Mr. Turner is, uh, is here to, um, you know, uh, do research for our, our team coming in January. And Pavel said, uh, sorry, I don't know whether I'll still be here in January. We then went to see uh, the editorial board of Rude Pravo. This was in 10th, 11th November. It was six, five, six days before the 17th. And uh, they were all extremely complimentary about a certain Václav Havel at that point. Um, the same happened when I went to um, Paul D. in, in Kladno, the, 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 uh, board of, the board of directors there uh, were quite happy to talk about Václav Havel. Because there had been the article in. Uh, I'm, in, I'm, in I'm sorry to interdict. Sorry. We just, if you can ask the question, since so the, you know, I have, needs, I have a question. Mr. needs from, time for, for the yeah. gentleman to reply. Sorry, sorry. I have a question from Jolian. You were very coy about the uh, the meeting um, in October, '89, uh, of dissidents after the uh, after September 8th. Could you be less coy and say who was there? Oh. Well, uh, it, was, uh, it was in the flat of uh, Yuzhi Dinspir, Václav Benda was present, uh, Yuzhi Rommel, I suppose Libusha Shohanova. I mean, I don't have a photographic memory, believe it or not. I, I remember some basic dates. He was in, okay, then it was, uh, would have been Jan Rommel. Anyway, one of the Rommels was there, but um, I do remember that Václav Benda was the one person who objected to my presence and was told by the others that I was no threat and that I was not going to leak anything and so on. I just sort of sat there and listened agog, amazed what, what was going on. So we still do have uh, one more question. Well, I have many if you don't want any. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'll... I have a final question that sort of relates to the situation in this country and let's say, let's say in, this, in the, the post-communist uh, area uh, 30 years later after the events that we were talking about and uh, uh, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll ask a sneaky general question with, uh, with warning you that you only have limited time to, to reply, I'm sorry about it. But uh, uh, let's say uh, we see uh, some some of the uh, some of the forces of the of the past are still here, and they're pretty uh, they're pretty uh, strong. Uh, there we do have in this country a, a a president that actually played a big role uh, during these events, and especially afterwards. And yet today he's uh, openly pro-Russian, pro-Chinese, even though that uh, doesn't seem to be in line with the foreign policy of this country. We still do have a communist party uh, under the name of communist party in the parliament that. Uh, uh, the current go government re uh, relies on, and uh, they seem to be even more more open pro pro Russian and pro Chinese. So uh, I don't want to ask a question. What do you see that the hopes of uh, of uh, of 1989 are dim? Because of course not. Well, we're sitting here. We can talk about it quite openly and say the things that we are. But. Uh, where do you see the source of the situation we are uh, here? Was it uh, was the post-communist were the post-communist post governments not strict enough? Uh, were they supposed to do things differently? Well, um, I think that first of all, the uh, simply renaming the Communist Party 
of Czechoslovakia, the Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia, and renaming Rude Pravo, Pravo, simply insufficient. Kicking out Jakes from the leadership was insufficient. The party uh, has failed to reform itself, first of all. Secondly, um, while lists of names were published of collaborators with, uh, with the STB, um, much has not been published to this day uh, who collaborated with military intelligence. And the files were not, those files were not destroyed and, and still are not being in, adequately investigated. Um, and the collaboration with the Soviet KGB and GRU of uh, Czechoslovak citizens has never been adequately uh, and thoroughly investigated. There is more uh, a rumor a rumor mill uh, of who did and didn't. And um, there was a very small window of opportunity to examine KGB files in the mid-90s in Moscow. Uh, there are other channels available still. Um, I don't know whether it's a weakness of Czech journalism, if you'll pardon, uh, but there are still taboos here uh, in dealing with prominent politicians. Uh, people get, uh, reporters get caught up in, uh, repeat, in stories that become shaggy dog stories uh, and just because someone denies it doesn't mean it's, it's true, but there's so much more they haven't scratched the surface, whether it's Babish or any of a number of other uh, politicians. There's much more to be found out that has not been reported. And that I find disappointing. What is holding them back? There was a lot of, when we, when we got to, um, 89 and 90 and 91 um, in the United States, but I think also here, a lot of wishful thinking about how things would go forward. Um, to think that there could be a unilateral um, improvement, that every day and every way things will get better and better. That's not um, the human experience any place. So we shouldn't be surprised if there have been ups and downs and setbacks. Um, but as you say, um, thank goodness it's not the situation that existed before 1989. I will share um, the mem a memory of a conversation that four of us from RFERL and the uh, um, Oversight Board of Board for International Broadcasting had <clears throat> in early 1990 with Václav Havel as we opened, prepared to open the Bureau, celebrated the opening of the Bureau here in uh, Prague. And Václav Havel said, he was speaking specifically of media, but I think it's a more general observation he had in mind. He said, it will take generations for us to overcome this burden of the communist system. And I think some of that probably is what's being dealt with in Central and Eastern Europe still. <laughs> today. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your memories. This was up. Uh, not yet. Yes. I just, I don't have an opportunity to speak later, so I didn't want to interrupt, but I have one factual question to, to Jolia. You mentioned the uh, demo in Bratislava on Easter. Uh, Good Friday. Yeah, Good Friday. 88. 88. And and uh, the tape of the shortwave radio. Is my memory FM. failing me, or did you later get a shortwave radio for yourself and alerted us to the, during the demonstrations in Prague, to the riot police coming in? They had a key password for it going to the stadium, I think. And, and then, no when we knew it, we should start from. Yeah. Um, I had a, a general issue, uh, a shortwave radio, as all foreign correspondents used to carry, because there was no internet, there were no smartphones. 
Um, so to find out what was going on in the world, uh, since Rude Pravo really was not enough, um, we, uh, we listened to the BBC and VOA and RFERL and whatever else we could pick up. And I found out at some point, no, I guess it was Czarnogórski who, when I said, well, what, what frequency is this on? He told me, and then I started looking and I found it on my FM dial, with, uh, FM dial, which I didn't generally listen to when I was here. And so, yes, I asked you, having listened before a demonstration one morning um, in 88, I guess, or 89, I said, they keep on talking about a mishidira, a, a mouse hole. And the mouse hole was the slang for a courtyard in Opetalova where demonstrators were chased into and forced to stand and wait. Misha Glenny was forced to stand there for interminably. Um, and then there was a reference to a stadium, and I didn't know, you know are they talking about Strahov or what is this? But I, the definition was, was unclear to me. And that's one, la I'll leave, this, uh, leave you all with, with this one last thing. So much was unclear in 1989 and even in 1990 when Misha Glenny gave me the first draft of his book, his first book, and I went through it. I said, Misha, how can you say this? We watched the same demonstrations from the same balconies. I, I saw and heard completely different things. And, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And he said, yeah, but Penguin wants it out by Christmas. I said, come on, <laughs> you know, let's get this straight. I have not written my book yet. I've been collecting material constantly since the 19... Actually, I still have the material from the 60s, but uh, when I was still, <laughs> still in, in uh, grade school. But um, all my interviews and now access to the secret police files, I'm only now starting to gain an understanding of how the system worked. It was, as Judy Dempsey from the Irish Times and the Financial Times would say, frightfully complicated. Yeah. And um, it was really a web. Why did I get accredited here? How was that even possible for the Voice of America to function here? The US public, uh, Embassy Public Affairs Officer told the uh, Foreign Ministry that if the Voice of America was not accredited, the Czechoslovak radio correspondent in New York would only be able to cover the United Nations, would not be able to travel more than 30 miles, 50 kilometers beyond Manhattan. The decision was made then by the Department of Inter for International Cooperation of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia on the grounds that A, we have nothing to worry about, and um, B, this means our, our man will be able to travel freely. Our man was collaborating with Soviet military intelligence as many, if not most, Czechoslovak citizens who are allowed out with their families to work abroad, whether not in diplomatic capacity, not under diplomatic cover, but as business people or journalists. And their task was to um, map out where US missile man silo sites were across the Great Plains. No one has written about this in the United States or here. Books on the missile man make no mention of what was actually going on on the other side. Well, your book should be out by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> or maybe next one then in that case. Nice try. All right. Well, so this was uh, Ross Johnson and Jolion Nagler. Thank you again very much. Uh, and we'll meet after the break. Thank you.